right, welcome everyone to today's STEM Teaching Essentials Workshop. We appreciate you coming out in the snow and uh, ice and everything else to get here. We have a great crowd today. So my name's Corey Feta Hartley. I'm from the College of Natural Science, and I am part of a growing team of people who work to arrange these things. My partner in the College of Natural Science is Stephen Thomas over here, and then from Ag and Natural Resources, we have Laura Bix in the back. Suzanne Lang over here from engineering. We have Niraj Butch, and um, joining us now will be Dinah Bradis, um, who's not here today. Uh, she's at UGAD, but um, she'll be here as well and, and help to organize these things. And then from Lyman Briggs, we have Kendra Cherivello, and another person joining the team will be Georgina Montgomery from um, um, the Lyman Briggs College. Um, so thank you. We're really excited to see this kind of um, attendance here today. Before I introduce our speakers for today, I want to announce um, the talk for next month. It will be on the same date um, because of February being a short month. So four weeks from today, same place. Um, the topic will be um, student narratives or learning narratives from uh, first generation students in STEM courses. So this is a follow-up on a workshop that was given a couple years ago where the panelists were um, students of color and their experiences in STEM courses. I attended as a participant and it's one of the best workshops of that type I've ever attended. I encourage you to watch that on the website. All of our um, sessions eventually become available online. As you can see, that's why we have cameras here. So hopefully you can uh, make that session as well. Um, before I forget, if you ask a question because of the cameras and because we're taping these, please wait for me or Kendra or someone else to bring you this microphone. It's not amplifying the sound, it's just um, for recording purposes. So if you can please wait, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Okay, so without further ado, I am excited to present two faculty members from our Department of Physiology in the College of Natural Science. Um, Erica Wehrwein is an associate pro professor and John Zubeck is an assistant professor. They are highly regarded instructors, very popular courses. Our students love the labs that they teach. And in addition to um, the work they do in their own classes, they've worked with a team of people in physiology to really try to improve <coughs> curricula, improve the student experience. And that has gone beyond just physiology, but more broad broadly to issues associated with our college. Um, so I'm excited for them to give us our the talk today on teaching and assessing transferable skills in STEM classes. All right, okay. You guys don't need microphones. Right, right. So, well, that's the case. Thank you uh, very much for making it out in the, the snow today. And for those of you who had snow day uh, issues and babysitting to, to make it in um, for the presentation, uh, we're, really, we're really grateful. Uh, for that. And it's good to see also a range of people who are also trainees and students here in addition to faculty because I think um, having a student perspective on things that, we, that faculty are discussing on how to improve your experience and your own employability will also give you a lens to look at your own training and think about are you getting these things in your courses from your PI uh, and uh, how, you might, how you might incorporate them if you're not otherwise getting um, getting these experiences. So I do want to start just very briefly uh, saying how it is that I ended up here. So when I took uh, over the capstone lab course in physiology when I first started my position here, it took me exactly one semester to realize uh, that we have amazing, talented, hardworking students and many of them were just getting stuck, right? So some of my very best students were getting to the end of their program and they weren't getting into med school, and they didn't quite know what to do about getting a job, and they were failing in job searches. And because I actually have two students' faces in mind that set me off on this whole journey six years ago about why, 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 right? So I'm going around asking, going over to career services and talking to people, going over to the med school admissions and talking to people, looking up some papers and talking to people. And, and flash forward here, now um, several of us in the department have actually taken it upon ourselves to try to really learn about this and incorporate um, these kinds of what we're calling transferable pro or professional skills into our courses because universally that's what I was hearing back. Why aren't my students getting on to the next step? it was a common answer. And so I want to share with you a bit of that journey, um, what I've learned in the process of um, trying to answer that question is why 
is Josh not succeeding, right? He was one of my students, that, that face that stands out to me from all those years ago. Um, why was he not getting on to the next step? So in recent years, I wanted to acknowledge the, the team. So we have a little group of four of us in the department, um, Adele, Chris, John, and I, that have actually been meeting. Uh, last year we met weekly and we talked about these things and what we're doing in incorporating these into our courses, what kinds of things we could um, uh, expand throughout the curriculum. And uh, Lori was uh, too busy. Lori is our, our fifth member of the team in physiology. She's uh, not available today. She's at another training. Um, but we have a core now of people in physiology that are thinking about these things, and we're um, glad to share our, our, our information with you. Um, and I acknowledge Brian here as part of the team. He's, he's been talking to me for several years now, and is also he's going to give a few slides um, in the presentation about how the Career Services Office can, can play a role in, in these issues as well. So uh, as it mentions here, we're using a, a, a new, brand new live polling system called Slido. So if you have a device out, uh, we invite you to participate. Uh, I do want to just get a sense uh, from the get-go here um, what colleges are actually represented in the room. I know this draws uh, a lot of uh, people from different, different places. And I think it might help me gear some of my comments towards the end about particular topics. So this question is, as a live question, if you don't mind uh, taking a moment to answer this. It would help if you could see it, right? The projector is on freeze. Here we go. So slido.com 1425, and I will unfreeze the projector. I didn't realize that was still happening. Um, so you can see. Yeah, and I was thinking, I, I knew a few colleagues from the uh, med schools were planning to attend too, so it's good to see some osteopathic medicine people too. Hmm? Hmm. The screen keeps freezing. Why is that? Okay, good. So a lot of NATSI, a lot of ag, a pretty good balance across here too, Honors College Engineering. So the engineering folks, um, I've actually been reading the engineering literature primarily. So as a, as a collective discipline, uh, engineers seem to really be on this professional skills development piece. And a lot of the great literature that I've been referring to is actually from, from that discipline. OK, so a lot of NAT side people. Thank you. Thank you. And the other question uh, that I would like uh, to ask you, it's not common that, in my experience, it's not common that people in the STEM fields explicitly list a learning objective relating to professional skills development in their class. And I'm just curious um, if any of you do that, if any of you have uh, listed any type of professional skills development, whether that be improved communication skills, scientific writing, uh, teamwork, is that listed as a learning objective in your course? Right, so good. So it means that there's a lot of people here who are already thinking about this and are incorporating that into their courses, which is great. And when I've given a similar presentation at other institutions, I haven't seen this. This is the first time I've seen more people in the room that have included that as part of their course than not. So that is fantastic. Uh, congratulations on that. Your students are really benefiting from that. And uh, um, I would like to probably learn from you and talk to you about how you're, how you're doing this. So from here, um, what, I, what I would like to do is just sort of reframe. Uh, a lot of times when we come to these workshops, we're thinking about how can I teach my class better? How can I improve uh, student learning in my class? And naturally, that's what we do, right? Writing good syllabus, writing a good syllabus, writing clear objectives, making sure they're aligned, doing nice active learning. Uh, but we also think back and we have to also then look at how our course fits into our departmental goals. So one of the things to think of is that physiology in recent years has been writing um, and deciding on what our programmatic learning outcomes are in the major and figuring out where in each of our courses do we hit on those things. So we're going to take a step even further back from that and say also, 
how is what I'm doing when I'm standing here facing my students and, and I'm thinking in a bigger picture? How is it that what I'm teaching and what I'm saying and what experiences the students are having that day, how does that fit into our whole university goals? And remind you that we have uh, undergraduate learning goals for the institution. Uh, and if you look at these, you'll see this theme repeated again and again and again throughout the slides. Like, what are the things that are really most important for students in their long-term career success? And it turns out that analytical thinking, effective communication, integrated reasoning, critical thinking, those are the things that employers and med schools were telling me back about what we really needed our students to do. So the good news is our university's learning goals are very aligned with what employers are telling us. And it, it helps us really plan excellent uh, educational activities. So when we're thinking about day-to-day -day things that we're doing in our course, remember that we're also aligning and we're trying to hit those targets. We're trying to graduate students that are, um, that are really well prepared to do all of those things. But, but further than that, when we start to say, like, that student that you're looking at that day is ultimately going to be your physician, maybe, right? Is ultimately going to be working out in the field. So we're also training future professionals. And I don't know how often we get a chance to really pause and think about that when we're delivering our content and we're designing um, our classroom activities, that the things that we're doing are really ultimately getting out to this realm, right? We're making informed voters, right? We're building successful healthcare field, um, in my case. And, and we want to make sure that every once in a while we hit pause when we're thinking about teaching our course and remember where those students are going. Like, why are they here? What's the value of their degree? So um, also, does your professional society, whatever that might be, mine is American Physiological Society, does your society have curriculum standards for undergraduate education? And if so, do they have anything mentioned about professional skills development? So in physiology, we're writing the national guidelines for our discipline right now, and that's one part of the national guidelines is professional skills development, meaning that all bachelor's degree programs of physiology should use as a best practice uh, formal ob um, learning uh, out objectives for uh, this. But maybe your society has those resources available to you. Um, I would encourage you to, to check. So then where we also come down to is thinking about your class in a, maybe in a different way if you haven't yet. So how is your course, your day-to-day -day activities in your course, how is that contributing to a useful, in quotes, what does useful mean to you um, or your students, but a useful degree. So are the students that are walking across the stage at graduation employable? Do they have a clear sense of where they want to be going? Are they, do they have the tools and resources that they need? Did we give them what they need to be successful to go on to their next step? So that's where we're gonna spend most of the time today. And in order to do that, I wanted to share with you sort of the process that we went through. First of all, saying, what's a useful college degree in my field? What, I have to know what my students want to do, right? I have to know where they're ultimately going, what their aspirations are. So I do want to talk a little bit about that part. And then we have to know, realistically, what are the hiring trends in your field? Um, and where our students are going, if they're going to grad or professional school, professional school what are the admissions guidelines for that? And do they have the right preparation to be successful? And then ultimately, what, what we're doing and trying, how we're trying to incorporate this in our classes. So how do we teach and assess this in an undergraduate curriculum? So for our students, uh, this graph represents physiology students. And I, I promise him that the majority of the talk is very broadly applicable to other programs. This is also what human biology looks like, and it's very similar to what neuroscience looks like. And these are consistent across the country when we look at national trends. So for our programs, 86% of our students are targeting some type of pre-health field. So that's important for me to know, right? Then I need to know what the admissions criteria are for those schools. And I also need to know that very few of our students are going towards research or are interested in that, right? Because the perception in our department was that a lot of people were targeting that, but it turns out that's not the case. So I ask you to think about who, what your aspirations are for your students um, to make sure that we're matching the kinds of skills development that we're doing to the preferred destination. So this is the population that we're working at. So largely um, pre-med students. And the good news for those students, and also for a lot of people in that side, we have a lot of pre-health students in those professions, so quickly. So over the last, you know, this is a few years here, but the 
the point here is the total number of applicants to med school is going up. A lot more people are interested in it. The good news that I said was that the number of people getting in is also increasing over time. So they're getting more people uh, enrolled in medical school. But the percentage of people that are ultimately getting in is going down. So in 2002, about half of the applicants were ultimately getting in, half, only half. So half are not. So we have to talk about what to do with those half. But now in 2013, um, this data was saying oh, we're down to only a 42% acceptance rate. And just think about this in numbers. 28,000 of our students, right, uh, from, from these numbers are not getting accepted, right? So how do we make them more competitive to get in, number one? And number two, if they don't get in, what, are the, what is the other option for them? And when we talk about hiring trends, uh, I'll just do a couple more quick slides on here. It, the, the US Board of Labor Statistics has great information about which uh, healthcare fields are growing. So it turns out things like physician assistant uh, have a lot more seats and a lot more growth. Same for nurse practitioner and other allied health fields above medicine. So it's important for us to look at this and say, well, maybe in our advising appointments or when we're talking to students about their career development, we can guide them. And John will talk a little bit about this, about how we're building that actually into our course for them to explore um, other healthcare fields that they might actually be more interested in doing. And certainly, it's helpful to know this as we're having conversations with our students. Now, this, I pulled as many uh, related majors as I could here. So uh, in terms of the number of students that are stopping with their bachelor's degree, we said, 86, 90% of our students are saying aspirationally we're going to go on to other programs. But this is what the numbers say. So the darker green is went on to get a graduate degree. The lighter green is did not. So did not in the light green. So let's just ballpark and look at this and say around half, around half of the faces that you're looking at, um, at least in these uh, life science related fields, about half of them are stopping with a bachelor's degree. And what does that mean? Like, have we given them a useful um, e experience in their undergraduate uh, training to, to be able to go on to a career? So these are what the numbers look like uh, nationally. In terms of other STEM jobs, we think a lot uh, because we hear a lot, oh, STEM job growth, STEM job growth, STEM job growth. So this is projected job openings by STEM occupations from 2014 to 2024. And what I want to draw your attention to, it's the computer sciences and then the engineers that really are where the STEM job growth is. So for us that are teaching in uh, life sciences or other things, we're down here, life sciences, physical sciences, math. The, the projected job growth is not as good, right? So that's also something that we need to know. Like, are we training too many students in these other fields, right? When we hear STEM job growth, I want to make sure that we're clear what the projections are. And then this is the 10 fastest growing bachelor's degree STEM occupations projected through 2024. And again, we're looking at some math, computers, engineering, uh, software development. None of these projected fastest growing jobs are in the life sciences, right? So that's something to be really uh, aware of, be mindful of uh, where, when, when we're training and when we're sending our students. So generally speaking, uh, uh, this is data from the census. And I, for me, I draw my attention here to biological sciences. If you're from engineering or other fields, definitely take a look at the other, care, uh, the other areas. But the graph here is looking at percentage of college graduates that ultimately end up with a career in the field that they trained. So in this case, I would say for biological sciences bachelor's degree holders, we have 16%. One six. Sixteen percent of bachelor's degree holders in the life sciences ultimately get a job in that sector. It means that they're going on and getting careers in other fields when they're done, right? So how would that change what we do in the classroom, how we teach our life sciences students if we knew that a lot of them were going to end up in management or in consulting or in a different field? Is that anything we should be concerned about? I don't know. Right? That's a question to ask yourself. But what we're saying is a lot of these students who are ending, half of our students are ending with a bachelor's degree, and only a percentage of them are staying in field. Why? Right? Do we need to do a better job training them to get those positions? Do we need to work with industry to make sure there are more positions? What do we need to do? So where do they go? 
Um, I picked physiology, and then I'll also show data from just general pre-health degrees. So this is where they go instead. So uh, some of them are still in health-related fields, um, but it's all over the map, right? General sales, uh, office business management, those kinds of things. And this is where I started, when I was looking at this, this is where I really started to think, you know, am I doing anything for those students that are ending up in management and business and other sectors? Like, is anything that I'm doing really useful to them if, is, if they're going there and ending up with jobs there? Or am I doing something wrong where they're defaulting into this position because somehow they're unqualified for the positions that are out there? And should I talk to the, my related industry partners and see if we could do a better job? So it's similar for when you lump all pre-health students together, um, same things. They tend uh, to be a little bit more in the health fields, but again, this is not going on to a healthcare uh, graduate degree. Um, but so they're going a lot of different places. So for, for me, so human bio, neuro, physio, those kinds of degrees, we have a lot of our students not being accepted. And so I started thinking, what about helping them track to careers you know, sooner and think about physician's assistant, think about nurse practitioner, think about other jobs, making sure I know what's on the entrance exams, um, including the fact that they've changed to focus on the admissions test and interviews have changed so that they're now screening for these things, including letters of recommendation. So you want to motivate your student to do uh, professional skills development like teamwork in your active learning environment. You might show them how you fill out letters of recommendation, or at least I do, for professional schools. If I have a student applying to physical therapy school, I don't fill out a letter. I get a grid on a Likert scale, and it says, how, have, how do they do at teamwork? How do they do at oral communication? How do they do at written communication? And it asks me to rate their professional skills, right? So luckily, I teach a lab class where I get a lot of chance to observe that. But do they know when they ask anyone else for a letter of recommendation that they have to be rated on those things? Has anyone really seen them perform those at all? You know, do they have time to practice that? So um, it really got me thinking. So uh, many of our students end up working in other fields. For us, we have a lot of underemployed and unemployed um, people. So I would encourage you to look for your specific discipline on the census data and the labor data because it's broken out by major to see. Um, someone in your unit, uh, maybe your advisor, maybe your curriculum director, wants to have that information um, to help make good decisions. And then, then it just really gets to this, like how do I help those people? Like how do I do that? Like do they know their options? Do they know what employers are looking for? And can we do something to explicitly teach our students in these STEM classes and prepare them for the next step? So what are the things that we're supposed to be helping them do to be successful? Uh, there are many, many, many articles that have come out about this. Um, and it goes by a lot of different names, 21st century skills, growth mindset, grit, all of these things. But we're really talking about a collection of generalizable life skills, right? We're talking about excellent communication, excellent teamwork, critical thinking skills. Those are the kinds of things that we're talking about. All right. So uh, I put this slide up. This is something that came out of the Career Services Office. I actually give this to my students on the first day of class. I don't know how many of you have seen this, but Career Services, maybe Brian can talk about it a little bit later when he comes up, but they went and interviewed and said, hey, people who are out there uh, pub, uh, accepting Spartan grads, what do we really need to have these students be successful at in order to achieve well in your industry. And it comes back to those same things, those, the university learning goals that I mentioned initially. So working in teams, critically thinking, solving problems, communicating. So these are the things that we heard back. What do we do in our undergrad classes to make sure our students are successful? The other thing that came out of this that I think is super important and it comes to how we can help them is this. The most important factor, employers tell us, is the ability to articulate what you've learned. And Brian has an activity and some resources about that. How do you help your students explain what they know, explain their skills, unpack what they've done? What if you have a flipped classroom, right? Or I'm pointing to Adele, she has a flipped classroom. Her students work in teams all the time. If an employer were to ask them, do you have any skills or teamwork, they might be like, oh, I don't know. How about we help them and say, hey, you did that in your class already, right? How did that work? Did she give you tips on how to do it better? Did you unpack that at all? Do you know how to speak about that? So Brian's gonna come back and talk about that. So a lot of our students have these skills. They just don't recognize it or know how to talk about it. A lot of you are doing this in your classroom because it works 
the, a lot of these things are effective for student learning. We're already doing it. We just haven't told the students that they're doing it, right? Maybe we just need to put that as an objective or tell them, hey, you're practicing professional skills right now. This is something that's sort of building your portfolio. Maybe we just need to tell them. Maybe we're already doing it and we, yep, we just need to articulate that ourselves. All right. So I also want to share some data with you. This is a Heart Research Associate, um, Associates survey. They went out and interviewed employers and students and asked them about these kinds of issues. So first, employers, what's more important, knowledge or skills, for your recent college graduates in order to advance in your company and have long-term career success? So is their knowledge of neuroscience more important than their teamwork skills? Or is it both? What's important? So they recognize that knowledge and skills are both important, but the key here is broad. So they were given a chance to say specific to this field versus broad skills, right? So what they're saying is employers overwhelmingly are saying, we want people who can, right, fill a variety of roles that have a pretty broad perspective, right? Instead of saying drill down to this very specific thing. So maybe a certain technique, like we really want someone to know how to do Western blotting. That's not what they're saying to us, right? They're saying we want people who have broad skills. And what's interesting is people always talk to me about this. Well, do students know what's best for them? Do students know what they want? Do they get it? And when they survey the students, it's basically the same. Like this, when students say, like, what's really important for you, do you think, when you get to your job? And they get it. Like their answers are really aligned already with what employers are, are saying, which, which is great, right? There's, there's some intrinsic motivation for your students to do this if you tell them. Right? We're helping you practice these skills that you need, and they, they likely know that they need them. So that's great. So it's not, it's not, we're not going to have a conflict in that sense. So the, what learning outcomes for bachelor's degree holders do employers think are most important? It's the same list again. Communications, working in teams, thinking, right? Same stuff again. And these are, look at these numbers. Like These are how many employers are saying those are the key things that we need to know. And students, same thing. Students are like, yeah. Yeah, I know that I need to do that. I know I need to do that. That is really important, right? So they're recognizing that too. Coming back a little bit to those who serve pre-professional students, these, this is the American Association of Medical Colleges. And I love the way they reframed this recently. Core competencies for entering medical students. Let's replace that with what does a bachelor's degree holder need to be able to do, right? So they're saying, Students coming into medical school need to be able to do all of these things. Same stuff coming up again. And very little <laughs> is focused on the actual content facts of science, right? It turns out um, the medical schools have really come to realize that their most successful clinicians are not people who had the highest MCAT score or the highest GPA. When they actually look at who, who ends up losing their license, who ends up doing unethical things, who ends up, or who ends up being most su successful, it's based on these things to the point that, that the med school interviews in some cases, including at our own, have gone to scenario-based interviews. It's no longer a face-to-face -face interview, that they'll actually give you a scenario that you have to act out, and they're gonna observe and see if they can pick up on anything in terms of these, these skills before they let you into the, to the program. All right. So I'm going to switch to the next question here. And this question is, now that we've talked a little bit about this, even if you don't have, um, if, even if you don't have uh, professional skills as one of your objectives of your course, how many of you, like if you really think about it, how many of you do something that could be reclassified? Could you just reframe some of the stuff you're already doing and sell it? Right? Do you do teamwork? Do you do writing? Do you do presentations? Do you do anything? That, that matches that list, critical thinking, problem solving. And I bet all of us do, right? It's just not all of us recognize that we do it or recognize that it's important or tell our students that we're doing it. So that's great, right? So we're all doing things. So it means like our students are having really wonderful, valuable experiences in our classroom and they're learning a lot because we're using the tools um, that have been shown to be effective for learning. But it turns out that we can double dip here and, 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 and frame that as professional skills development and it would take our students um, far. By, by doing that, and that's great. So kudos on that. All right, one of the things is that the fewer employers think are important, and I just want to focus on this. Uh, employers are like, meh, 
being up to date and current in your field. Medical school is the same thing. It's a bullet point, like, yeah, you should know your field, but these other things. And that's really hard to, to reframe. Like a couple years ago when I was reading this, right, all I do is think about my content, right, and how to deliver it and, and how to keep people up to speed. And like, we share current research articles and we're right there doing that. But if that's not the right thing to do, then, ah. Uh. So I, it made me really think about what, what else we wanted to be doing in class. Students felt the same way. They recognized maybe these things are less important too. All right, now this, this is, um, this is important. I intentionally blocked out some information here um, for a moment. So uh, American Association of Colleges and Universities, they surveyed employers in the dark blue and students in the light blue. And they said, are you good at professional skills? Are your employees good at professional skills? So one of the things we notice is that the student perception of their skill <laughs> is quite a bit greater than the feedback that they're getting, right? So that's one very obvious thing. Right? And none of us are particularly good at knowing, knowing our own skill set. It's, it's true. I've actually read some psych and social work just because I'm interested in that. And we overwhelmingly overestimate our, our abilities. We do. And my favorite, my favorite study, I don't have the real, this actual citation, but they surveyed employees in, in a company and said, rate yourself. How good are you? Like, are you in the top 50%? Are you in the top 10% of employees? And 95% of the people rated themselves in the top 5% of employees, right? Like, everyone thinks they're the best person at the company, right? So we, it's like we just, we're not that good at it. So that's even something to practice a little bit, is like getting it accurate. So making sure students do get feedback on these skills, making sure we find a way to do that. But the other thing that's important to me about this is even the most confident uh, answer here, 66% of students felt competent in this professional skill, right? If I said your best student got a 66% on the exam, would you be happy with that? No, right? So that means like as we're shaking hands at graduation, we're saying like, okay, most of you are completely feeling uncomfortable going forward, like <laughs> good luck, right? Yeah, so, so I think we can do better, right? I think we can do better. Um, so again, these are the same same kind of things that we've been talking about again and again and again, but important to think about it um, through that lens that I was just describing. All right, so next question here. Um, have you considered um, at all, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain this question first. So we, when we talk to employers, we see there is really important underlying principle here. That is, it's not just that everybody should major in like business and like right, just everyone should just take teamwork classes and management classes and we shouldn't worry about the field. Not true. The question is really getting at your, your field, you have to know your field. Your field has different expectations for communication standards, different expectations for teamwork. There's, there's some nuances across disciplines where we need people trained in the discipline to be coaching the skills appropriately. And so if you are doing this, like have you thought about relating your content knowledge or your skills to a particular job? So in my class, when we're doing a particular skill, we might say, this is how it applies in the emergency room when you see a patient. This is why we're doing this thing, right? Oh, okay, right? So are there ways that you can frame some of the stuff you're doing in terms of a likely career that your students are going into, right? Of course, that requires you to know what your students are going into, but is there a way that you could just simply add on a couple things in your day-to-day -day operation um, to help students see that relating content knowledge and the skills to their occupation or to these important um, professional skills? Right. Now, when I've talked to different groups about this in my own department, within the institution, in other institutions, I get a lot of like, wait, that's not really what I'm trained to do. That's not really my job, right? Shouldn't their parents have taught them to be a team player when they were kids? Shouldn't they have learned to share and cooperate? Maybe they learned this in kindergarten or elementary school. Like, I don't think I should be helping them do this. Well, even in the institution, like, isn't, doesn't Brian do this? Like, why should I do this in my class, right? Doesn't the lab class do this? Isn't that why we have an advisor, right? There's a lot of people saying, like, doesn't someone else do it? 
Well, if the grad schools and professional schools want that, let them train them. If the employers want that, let them train them when they get there. And I would argue that this is shared responsibility, right? This, these are lifelong skills. And probably at each level, we could argue that there is a case to be made for practicing and developing these things, right? But I will say there is a big giant arrow pointing at higher ed. And I'm going to show you some of the reports that have come out, governmental level reports that are like, hey, you guys, <laughs> like teaching our bachelor's degree students. Yeah, you really need to think about this. And so one of those documents, uh, and I, I will gladly share all slides. It is also being recorded, but I'm happy to have Corey distribute this to the list of people who registered so you don't have to frantically write down all of these reports. But STEM 2.0, we've reworked STEM education in this report. And the number one thing, number one thing that they want us to focus on in terms of um, competencies are employability skills. Undergrad STEM educators, the new number one thing we're supposed to be working on is this. The discipline specific skills like bench science and the, the things sometimes we're thinking about is now number four, right? It's not gone, but this used to be the answer. This used to be what we were supposed to do and now we're supposed to be doing all these things. Helping them think about innovation, learning to use digital platforms and be comfortable in that space. But number one is employability skills. Uh, the National Association of College Employers has put up this fantastic website full of career readiness materials, including things you can give to your students. Just give them this website, let them browse around. Just even doing that is great. There are some things here on like career readiness flyers, like how do you quiz yourself on if you're ready for your own career? And all of these things, there's a beautiful, beautiful website that's put together um, that I refer my students to. Um, Employability skills framework. This is also a good place. We're talking about developing workplace skills and relationships. My discipline has put out a document. Physiology has put out a document. What are the professional skills useful for physiologists? And perhaps your field has done this as well. But we now have a guiding document that's been put out. So there's a lot of resources. And what's interesting is if you just do a quick Google search for employability skills, wow. It has blown up in the last few years. Like this is, this is just getting to be hot, hot topic. So how are we going to do it? How are we going to do this? So first of all, yeah, we can. We can. Um, and we already are. You saw all of us are already doing things in our classroom that would be um, useful to students. But the thing is, students want this. Some of the research would say these papers, students are reporting having educational expectations not entirely consistent with the practice of the university. So that's saying like students are expecting that they're going to learn this, but they're not really feeling like they are, right? They feel that they have limited employability skills. When you survey students, yeah, maybe half of our students or less feel like mildly competent in those skills. And I was saying like I started doing this into my class and students, I was blown away by their responses like, yes, please, please help us. Like we want to do more of this. That's the Probably the most popular thing that I've ever done in my class was just add a couple self-assessment surveys, like what's your teamwork style, what's this, what's that? And they were saying they felt like that was really useful to them. Um, and it is possible to still do this and be true to your content. And the, the point here, again, I just come back to, you are all excellent educators creating wonderful learning experiences using the best tools and techniques out there. And it just so happens that those things are, you're already doing it. Um, and, and if you just kind of tweak your learning outcomes or objectives or something a little bit in your class or think about that, you probably are going to help your students go a long way. Um, people argue it's easier to do in lab classes, but it definitely can be due in other formats, and I want to share with you. Again, I'm going to give credit. A lot of the, the research that I've found is coming from engineering journals, so they have fantastic, fantastic resources. If you want to see great review papers and summaries, the engineer, engineering field by far is the best that I've seen so far. So, you're already doing this, incorporating techniques to help students learn. You're building those skills. So if you have lecture, uh, if you have, um, sorry, if you have activities or labs, if students work in groups, either live or online, if students are doing presentations or writing, they're already practicing this and they're already doing it. Right. Now, before I turn it over to Brian to speak to you a little bit, I want to point out that in my journey to help figure this out, I realized there's a lot of people who know a lot of stuff, right? There's a great body of literature. We have resources on campus. We have other people who are doing this and are willing to share. Um, and so before I turn it into Brian, I'm just curious to know how many of you have, um, especially those who have a learning objective for the course related to professional skills development, how many of you have had 
Brian coming into your classroom or used resources on the career website. Have you, have you used that or accessed those resources at all? Are you aware that that's out there? Because he, he has some great, great things to share. So Brian, you have you have a good audience to share all of the great things that you're doing. This is great. It's great. Yeah. 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 It's wonderful. So yeah, it turns out that Brian has a lot of great ideas and great resources, and he can come talk to your class and come talk to you. Um, so uh, I'm going to flip this over and let Brian uh, okay. have a few moments to talk to you. Do I have to wear this? It's can for recording hear? the video. Oh, I see. Okay. So I'll clip this on. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm a, I'll hold this. Um, thank you for coming today, Eric. This is, this is great. Um, the good news and the bad news. The good, uh, I should mention I'm also an instructor. I teach a uh, science and health uh, career development course every year. Been teaching it for about nine years now uh, with students from the College of Natural Science. Very well received, very well reported by your stuff that you know intuitively and and I think this is the catch there's no question I, I also do a lot of advising with students there's no question that the curriculum is developing skill sets for our students how many of you have heard of the t-shaped professional okay basically it's it's what Eric was talking about the t-shaped professional more employers including professional programs because I work a lot with graduate programs, programs etc both sides both worlds want to see these skill sets. They want the applicant to be able to articulate and communicate those skills because they really need that adaptability. They really need the flexibility to be able to do it well, but equally important, if not more important, and this happens all the time in my class anyways, students either over or under exaggerate their ability to articulate their skills. They pick up the skills. They don't always realize they pick up the skills they're practicing it, they're not very good at getting a good assessment of their ability to articulate it. Does that make sense? So for example, if I ask the students, because I do a lot of class presentations, how many of you have had lab, whatever, blah, 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 any kind of science classes, the hands all go up, right? Then I say, how many of you have actually had a marketing course or actually had a speech course? Very rarely does a hand go up. Here's the problem. They've got all this knowledge. They're very bright but they're not really good at sharing it. That applies to whether it's resumes, whether it's cover letters, whether it's personal statements, which I do a lot of for graduate programs. They're not very good at sharing that information. So I just want to share with you some resources available and what I've picked up, what I know to be true because we've got stats to support it <clears throat> with our specific students at the College of Natural Science, and then um, obviously invite you to take advantage of the resources. We all know everybody's really busy, so I just want to make sure you know about our resources. Again, the, uh, the, the, the main site is Career Services Network. Behind this site, there's obviously a lot of tabs. We don't have time to get into all the things, but there's a lot of information about career fairs, professional school fairs, uh, med programs, clubs, all kinds of stuff is on this site. And there's plenty of icons on the top tabs for you to, to look it up. In particular, students, uh, because we've got at least Nat Psy, and my understanding is there's four or five colleges represented here today, every college, uh, at least in the sciences, has a career consultant. I'm with Nat Psy, but if you're Briggs or you're Ag, you've also got a career consultant. Hopefully you're taking advantage of that, because the career consultant, I'll speak for myself, for my colleagues, but the career consultant does a lot of career advising, does a lot of uh, classroom presentations, works a lot with employers, with professional programs. So they're a really ideal link for you to be connecting with. I know from the faculty I've done presentations for over the years, again, it's something that I think the instructors know the value of it, and once I come in and talk about it, it's not me, but it's just sharing the resources. They definitely see an impact on the students, and then we're invited again to come back. And again, we just want to make you know um, that I know you're all busy, but if you want to take advantage of the resource at your college, it's there for you. The other thing is career services. We have two hubs, and I won't go into how it's broken down. 
for general services, such as a basic resume. A lot of our students will say they have a resume, but when it's reviewed by me or another uh, career uh, consultant, we definitely see a lot of gaps. We definitely see poor um, formatting, et cetera. So I want to encourage you to take advantage of just our general career services where we pay student advisors to do general career resume reviews. We've got online postings for um, drop-in hours. So if a student says, well, I don't have time to do this, we, we, can, we can say, okay, then drop in for 10 minutes. Those are posted as well. So there's a lot of resources in that area. And then again, I don't know if any of you um, receive my newsletter. If you want, I know at our college we have a career newsletter you can receive every month, which has a lot of information on it about science and health related careers. So again, plenty of resources. Feel free to send me an email or something if you have questions about it. They're there for you. We want to make sure you're using them as effectively as possible. Let me drill down a little deeper with advising. I see a lot of students who are initially pre-med, pre-professional, and by the end of sophomore, beginning of junior year, they're hitting the wall, right? So some are pretty devastated. And if they're taking a major where they honestly don't realize the skill sets they have, they, they, they really suffer from, I wouldn't call it depression necessarily, but a lot of anxiety about what they're going to do because they were always going to be... Um, a doctor or they were always, always going to be a vet or whatever from the time they were this this high. Good career services is going to help students be very realistic, very practical. Uh, I don't know if there's physics representation in here. Is Dr. Tesmer in here? But we have really good majors, but unless the student sees the value of that major beyond their initial goal, they have a tough time doing job search. Is that making sense? What I want to show you is just some little exercises, real simple, they're web-based so you can call them up. And students, I guarantee you they work because I use them in my class. I've used them for three years, these methods in my class. Because you might be too busy to use them or you just say, hey, go to this website or get a friend to review this with you. And it's really helpful for, I think it'll be obvious reasons for you. Um, before I go to the next slide, are there any questions about general resources or that you should all have a career consultant in your college? And if not, please contact me and I'll make sure I introduce you to that person. Can I go to the next slide? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, would it be possible for you to turn a uh, call up this website for me or not? Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. College and NASA, as a result of my teaching for the past eight years, I noticed that gap over after a couple of years where students initially, in fact, I did evals and I did uh, pre and post evaluations with students, non graded, by the way. So and they were optional for students to take. Where when the student first came into class, I said, where would you say you're at at this skill set level and your ability to talk about it? Some overrated their ability, like Erica was saying earlier, that they thought they were really good at something when in fact they weren't very good at communicating it. And a lot of us students would undervalue it to where they'd say, well, I'm not really good at talking to people. Really good at whatever. So there's all kinds of things within those non, uh, those transferable soft skill sets where students were, and there, through just a couple of these exercises uh, we did in the class, which are really simple and easy, they got it. They got the concept, which was transferable to their job application process, and you'll see why in a minute. But also through their professional school, also to the personal statements. I don't know if you ever asked to review personal statements. Also with the personal statements, they got it. Because what they were lacking was the paradigm for marketing. The paradigm, they're like, I don't want to be a salesperson, Brian. It's not about sales, it's about can you correctly inventory your skills that you're picking up in your, in your major, and can you convincingly articulate those to another person? Makes sense, right? For an interview, for professional school, whatever. So, if, um, Erica, if you could go to option one. This is on the NatSci website. We developed this uh, a year ago. It went live about nine months ago. These are obviously the 12 essential skill sets. We know for a fact, employers say, these are what we want every applicant to be able to talk about. We know that. And by the way, the last four on this sheet, if you can scroll down, Erica, are science-specific skill sets, which kind of me because part of my job is also meeting with employers 
And I asked him to review the 12 essentials, which we've had around for years. And I said, in addition to these 12 essentials, is there anything we're not getting for science and health majors? Now, some of you may not be surprised, but they wanted to see evidence of self-motivation in the lab. They wanted to see evidence and the ability to articulate enthusiasm, empathy, and curiosity. I don't know if any of you are surprised by that, but that was a really, that's a soft skill that import employers, including the labs, mm -hmm. including programs, professional programs, want a student or an applicant to be able to communicate effectively. Can I go to option two, please? Now this is where hopefully it's not intimidating or anything. I'm gonna walk you through the real basic exercise of skill set articulation. I'm gonna walk you through you picking, if you could take a minute, and I'd like you to either write down or type or think for yourself one of those 12 or 16 essential skills, and we'll flash back to it, that you know you have. And I'd like you to write down in one minute or less how you're gonna say that to another person. I know I'm a great communicator. Okay, let's hear what you have to say in one minute or less to an employer, a professional, who asks you, show me that you're good at that, that you say you are. Is that making sense? You say you're good at it, I want to hear your 30 second commercial for how you're good at it to an applicant. Can you go back? There they are. So pick one. I'm going to give you one minute. Just write down. This is what I know I'm really good at. Again, it's not meant to be embarrassing, but hopefully you'll get the idea. I'm really good at this and within 30 seconds to 60 seconds, I know I can articulate this effectively to um, an employer or someone from a professional school uh, panel. I know I can do this. So one minute. Any questions about this? This is what my students do. Now we're going to critique this. Okay? Now, do you believe your response was ineffective? Or, uh, can we go up a little, Erica? I'm sorry. Up a little more. Mm -hmm. Okay, right there. So what would you say to the employer? How long it took you? I'm assuming it took you a minute or less. Scroll down a little bit. Now, this is your rubric, your scoring. How effective was I in communicating to that person? Described it very little of the, the actual skill. I made very general statements. I gave a skill. I showed no connection to the skill. Just kind of talked about why I think I'm a good person, whatever. Or were you very effective in doing it, that you understand the skill, you can talk about it specifically, you could give an example of using the skill, meaning it's not just my opinion that I'm good at something. We all know about metrics. We all know about indicators. What indicator did you use or metric did you use in your response to prove to that employer you know the skill versus it just being your opinion? Make sense? And then highly effective, I did this very well. I was able to give an example. The employer was able to understand what I had to say. In fact, the employer was able to give me good feedback about my ability to express that. Now, how many of you think you were super effective at that? And I'm not going to call on you to read your summary. How many of you thought, well, I thought it was pretty good, pretty effective? A few? I mean, like, ah, I guess I wasn't that effective. Why is that even relevant, Brian? Anybody? So everybody did great then, right? Now I'm going to give you uh, an example we use, an acronym very commonly used in career services. Uh, very, it's very easy to understand. Most of you know employers want what they call behavioral interviewing, meaning we want you to prove to us you have this ability, not just say you have it. So they use a PARC acronym. How many of you have heard of a PARC acronym? A few of you. PARC acronym is really basic, or the STAR. Have you heard of a STAR acronym? Okay, real basic. You're, the, the student has got to tell the employer, this was a problem we experienced, this was the action I took, showing my skill and telling them I have. These were the results of that action, which obviously should be pretty decent. And this is the knowledge I gained by taking that step that I believe will contribute and help me be a strong candidate for this position. Pretty easy, right? Now, the last part of the exercise, this is important, I'd like you to take the park, problem, action, results, and knowledge I gain that make me a really good professional, and I want you to apply that park to your brief summary of what you said your skill is. And then I'm going to have you talk for 30 seconds with a partner next to you to convince him or her that you've got it. But I'm going to give you a minute first to put it into the park format. Fair enough? 
Any questions about that? You're going to use the PARC format to answer the employer's question, how can you prove to me you've got this skill if you think you're good at it? Identify the problem. How do you report it? What action you took? The results of that action? Or how it makes you a good candidate for this job or this program? Pretty easy. Now, we're going to take, and this was built into the program. Thank you, Erica, for giving me the time to do this. I want you to, it's intentionally experience this. Like, I know I'm educated. I know I'm bright. I know I'm good at this, whatever. Why is it I'm struggling with this? This is what the students experience only times 10. I want you to take a partner on either side of you, and I want you to first ask your partner, prove to me you have this skill, and have the partner read it to you or tell you. Evaluate that for 30 seconds with your partner. Then I want you to reverse the roles so that your partner gets the same opportunity. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes to do that. Pick a partner. I don't care who it is. One person. Okay. Okay, for the sake of time, we've got to bring it all back here. Now, did anyone, I'm just curious, and I, I would on this. But did anyone notice the difference between when they first gave their assessment of their skill versus using it in the park and talking about it? Did anybody notice that? A few of you. How many of you were surprised at all by using a park, something as simple as park? Did it, get, did it guide you in answering the question? Do you walk away feeling like you got a little more confidence about the skill rather than what you had when you first summarized it? Right? That's all it is. That's all you do. You just get the feedback, you get the student talking about it. Where it helps, where it's really beneficial, at least as an instructor, I get feedback from my students on this. It helps them with their confidence as far as talking for jobs. It helps them with being able to actually identify the skill sets that they're picking up in their coursework. It actually helps them to convincingly communicate that through their cover letter or through their resume or there's no question about it. It's pretty simple. It works. Career services, we have plenty of career advisors, general career advisors, as well as your college career consultants. How many of you have ever done a mock interview before? A few of you? We do mock interviews where we might have the students say, OK, you want to get into med school. Tell me about this quality. Or tell me, we know the scenarios, the questions for med school applications, right? If they have this little. I don't want to call it a gimmick, but this little tool, it really helps them become more confident about guiding them for the response thing. And I know, that, I know that's not always possible in, a, in the classroom, but knowing that you have the resources and say, I'd like you to go online, do this real quick, and make an appointment with Career Services, even if it's just uh, uh, drop-in hours, and do a quick five-minute, ten-minute talk about your skills with respect to this major and how you're picking up skills that are relevant there's no question in my mind that they're picking up really good skills. The students just aren't very good at knowing how to talk about them. And obviously, the park gives them that, that ability to do it. Can I go to the last page, please? Mm -hmm. The slide? The last slide, yes. Yep. Finally, has, have any of you heard of ONET? Two, three, four of you. ONET I've been using for over 12 years. It's a free career services website. There's thousands of career resources out there. This works, in my opinion, for our students. You can type in, and we don't have time to get into it, but you can type in your particular degree, whether it's physics, whether it's bio, whatever it is. And, oh, now, Erica, if you have time, could you type in, I don't care, chemistry mm -hmm. yep. on that uh, ONET? Mm -hmm. And it'll give the students a really good snapshot of the skill sets required to be successful in that particular profession. That helps them in many ways as far as helping them put together. They can look at things like teamwork and say, well, being a chemist involves this skill set. Well, I did that in my lab. Then it's obviously begging the question, do you have that anywhere in your resume? Right? Pretty simple. The problem is the students aren't thinking that way. So again, is this on chemistry? Yep. So this is on chemistry. You're going to be familiar with just the general as well as the specific. Can you scroll down real quick, Erica? A little bit. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Keep going, please. You can open any of these. 
It'll also get, oh, stop there please. It'll also give the student academically uh, what's required to successfully get into that particular area. So if you're looking at, how many of you, you're familiar with gap year stuff, right? Gap year planning. It'll give them information about what kind of degree they need to step into that field. Some obviously are gonna say PhD, 90% or more have to have a PhD. That's giving them a reality check on their game plan, and it's a soft way to do it. And it also obviously makes it very easy for the parents to take a look at it as well. And then finally, if you could scroll down a little bit. Oh, that's enough. I'm sorry, go up a little. Sorry, that's good. Mm -hmm. We also have resources, and I do a lot of these as well. Have you heard of the Strong Interest Inventory? A couple of you. I do hundreds of the Strong Interest Inventories with students. What's that? They usually hit their wall of, I'm not going to be a doctor. I'm a failure. I'm whatever, I'm not gonna do this. Let's say they're, they're uh, physics, and they were planning on becoming an astronomer or whatever. They take the strong, they find out they have a love for the skill sets in physics that are transferable into math, or are transferable into computer development. Making sense? So it gives them a realistic feedback about options available and then obviously they can find out what kind of careers they can go into using their math, using their whatever skills they've picked up in that curriculum. I'm a realist, so I try to make sure that they're looking at things realistically. But as Erica said at the beginning, a high percentage of our students do not go on for that PhD or do not go on to that school. And this is a very realistic and practical tool to use for helping them see there's a lot of things out there, but they have to take the steps to check into it further. I hope that's fair. I'll wrap this up. Hope I didn't go over. If you have any questions afterwards, I'd be glad to answer them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, so with this, I, I just, I, I just sort of like food for thought when Brian is talking about those things. Like, is there a way when you're coaching students on the first day when you're doing, if you're doing team-based learning or case studies or students working in groups, like, is there something that you could do, right? Have them do a little short activity like this, right? We just did teamwork for the first time. Like, how do we talk about that? Like, can we incorporate any of these small things, you know, just right into our class um, for a couple points, you know, and, and really sort of help you know, so right now all of them go to Brian for help or they take his class, but maybe collectively we can all do this um, in bits and pieces and, and really help with the, the process. So um, I, I actually had set up the talk um, in the spirit of uh, something I learned from uh, my colleague Doug Lucky. It was kind of like a choose your own adventure. So there's like an assessment piece that we could do. There's like a what are we doing in physiology piece that we could do. There's a couple different things and we were gonna do a little bit of surveying on that. But um, since we're running a tiny bit short on time, I, I am gonna do, let John do his part first and then we'll snapshot the last few minutes on the choose your own adventure part. So um, I'm gonna turn to John's part uh, here and let him take a shot at what he's been working on, which is absolutely fantastic. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so my name's John Zubek. I am the course director for PSL 311, which is a physiology lab for pre-health professionals. And but prior to coming to MSU full time, I was uh, working in healthcare for about 14 years in various capacities and for about 10 in direct patient care as a physical therapist, um, but also teaching on the side. So, so this was a really nice opportunity for me to work with students who are, are entering the field uh, more on an academic level. Um, but I'm kind of lucky in that sense is that I can kind of gear a lot of our professional skill development and things like that towards a group of students who are hopefully going in that, that particular direction. So I just wanted to give you a quick little flavor of things that we do and many of these you're probably doing or problems that you find in your classes or labs, but we're framing it in a way that Erica and Brian are talking about. So we're, we're hopefully giving them uh, actually something to discuss. So how do students really know what are some of the you know, professional skills or soft skills? So Carrington College of Health Professions defines a lot of different soft skills that, that people might need to go into the health professions. Um, and you could say, well, you know, how do you teach empathy and all those kinds of things? Well, we, you know, obviously you can fake empathy in many situations, but you know, we, we have students performing certain activities in class where we say, hey guys, I know you're a little bit anxious about stimulating a nerve to get your muscle to twitch, 
or pricking your finger to get a small blood sample. Um, but these are opportunities for you to sort of define empathy, right? What are your patients going to go through uh, when you're asking them to do things that are probably not going to be comfortable for them and are probably at a higher intensity level? So these are opportunities to think about how they felt or how they got past it. Uh, we obviously do a lot of team modeling. And you know, we, 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 want, we want students to compete in certain ways, um, but they don't really know how to get out of that competitive mode once they enter the healthcare field. So I've worked with a lot of interns and residents and whatnot, and they, they constantly are competing all the time. So it's like, well, how do we get them to work together, right? We don't really teach them how to do that. So we've been looking for different models of teamwork. And Belbin's models, and I have some examples of these too if anybody's interested in, in them, it defines nine different roles that people can play in a team environment. So sometimes in healthcare, you know, you can't be leader or follower. Uh, your patient might be leader. You're just sort of guiding them. So there's different ways to contribute to the team. And we explicitly talk about these and, and choose different roles that they might find comfortable uh, to do for that day. We talk about different uh, communication strategies. So one specific one in healthcare is the SBAR approach. So situation, background, assessment, recommendation, and they go through different scenarios um, and decide, you know, was this communication strategy effective or not? Uh, we do a self-assessment, and I'll show you an example of that here very shortly. It's, very, it's modeled after a clinical assessment, something that I would take as an annual review, uh, and we model it for them more in a laboratory setting. Uh, we had a particular problem with people maybe not coming in as prepared as they needed to be, and they were taking too long with some of the activities and stuff, so we initiated a productivity and time management, and we framed it in that way. Uh, we also have some ethical scenarios that we go to. These aren't the big ethical scenarios, you know, that you need teams of people for. We're not pulling anybody's plug, right? But we're discussing little decisions that people make in their daily uh, activities as a professional and what direction do those decisions kind of take them. I mean, it can really, the, the things that they decide can take them in some bad directions and things that they probably didn't anticipate. Uh, we go through a little bit of health insurance regulatory compliance. I mean, there's a lot of agencies that regulate health care, uh, 30 in all, and they don't always communicate. So what are you getting yourself into, right? These, are, these guys are putting rules and policies on you that conflict with each other oftentimes. How are you going to handle those situations? Uh, interprofessionalism, working well with other professions, not just thinking you live in this silo and everybody else you know, does their own thing. Uh, we have a modeling project. And then we do a one-on-one -on -one skills assessment and we, we gear it towards, all right, we're going to put you on the spot a little bit, but you're also going to learn in this scenario as well. And then uh, lastly, we do just some basic facts versus information. We want an evidence-based society, right? We as healthcare providers need to hold ourselves to higher standards. And we give them examples of myths that they've held on to for many years, um, but probably shouldn't be propagated any longer. So within our lab structure, we do a pre-lab learning module. They come together and they do a lab module. And we feel like the professional and some of the soft skill introduction is good for our post-lab reflections. So some of them are very specific uh, towards uh, physiology. So we have some case studies. But then we start off with, with going, taking them through a series of modules, some of them being career path oriented. Some of them being, hey, you're, you want to help people, but what happens when you can't help them? What happens when they don't want your help, right? It, makes, it sort of makes them think for a few minutes. We're also putting together some, some new ones. Um, you know, oftentimes students or interns or whatever get themselves in situations where they may be harassed. And we're working with, we'll be working with an outside professional to sort of put together some ways that students can protect themselves or, or recognize when they're being harassed in these situations. Uh, so we felt that this is a good way for us to introduce it and then we infuse it into the lab. So we do an introduction process and then an infusion. And then when we grade them, so we're explicitly grading them on some of their professionalism and we break it up into three different categories. Um, and a few of our TAs and Valerie's here who have been very helpful in implementing these and developing them. Uh, but we look on the completeness aspect. So oftentimes healthcare workers are not very good at completing what we started. We're not good at this. So we're helping students identify, well, when have you not completed something fully? Right? Just sticking something into a box doesn't mean that it makes sense either. 
So they have to kind of self-reflect and step back. We know that we can't see everything with their professionalism, but um, we know that we make it so, it's so important to us that we assign points to it, right? And there are situations where we may have to retract points. And then of course we go into our correctness models. This was an example of a self-evaluation that they do. Um, so at the beginning and the end of the semester, they rate their expertise levels and uh, based on these mirroring, and there's various soft skill competencies and technical competencies that we do throughout the lab. And at the end of the semester, they have to justify and explain, uh, give an example of when they did this in the lab, when they showed this. Okay? And this is very much geared towards an annual review, something that I would have to take in a hospital. Uh, one example from a student for their soft skill competency is they said they felt that they worked a little bit better in teams, um, they were able to divide the responsibilities a little more effectively to get the common goals done, right? Uh, another student on their technical competencies for literature discernment, um, they were in a particular subgroup for this, but they were able to bring in resources, so they weren't searching in lab for evidence-based resources to answer their questions. They already had them ready. Okay, so these are things that we're also getting some feedback on. Uh, at the end, they do a final assessment of their learning and their growth. This student chose to talk about interprofessionalism, so why it's important and why communication amongst different professionals and how to do that was important to her and she'll carry that forward. Uh, we had a particular problem as mentioned previously with students maybe not contributing as equally in the labs, right? Um, or the time management wasn't as effective. So they're all going to be uh, held, and especially in healthcare and various other industries, they're held to kind of a productivity standard, right? So when they leave for the day, um, they're held to sort of a, sort of a number, uh, a calculation that determines, well, how effective and how efficient were they for that daytime? And I said, well, let's, let's kill two birds right here, right? We can introduce a productivity standard, and then we can also get some time efficiency out of it. So we introduced this last year, and part of that was randomizing them into groups. But we explicitly tell them, you know, you can't choose who comes to your ER, you can't choose who comes to your clinic, you have to learn to work with all kinds of people, right? You can't just work with your friends all the time. So by doing that, it frames it a little bit different way. We assign them to subgroups to prepare. Um, and then each person prepares their, their items. Well, how do we enforce this? Well, just like Medicare does, we audit them. So we randomly pick three people, every class, and we audit them. And they have to show us their preparation work. If they don't, then that's a point deduction for that person specifically. And I say, yeah, it's not fun. Medicare does this to us. We have to sort of live with it. So you need to be ready, right? Um, and then they have a productivity report at the end of the day. So, for example, if Eric and I were partners for that day, we would have this mirroring activity at the end where their level of pre-preparation, contribution, and downtime. They don't always know what to do with their downtime or what downtime is. So we're, ha we're actually putting a quantitative value to that. And then they would scroll down and there's a number of these mirroring, you know, what's a one, what's a three, what's a four. And at the end, they get a score, just like I would if I'm working in the hospital that day. And if it's below a certain score level, they would also get a deduction for that. So it's, it's introducing framing, but then we're also getting something out of it. And what have we found? We're getting a reduction in some redundancy of questions or, or types of questions. So students are not asking some simple questions that they should have been prepared for to when they come into the lab. Uh, they have a better contextual knowledge of key words. So we require that they use certain key words properly in their uh, lab submissions. And they're, they're, they seem to be connecting that a little bit better. We're having less deductions of that. They're coming in with good validated resources already instead of using lab time to search for these constantly. And then we've had about a, a 25 to 30 percent reduction in the number of students who are taking beyond the allotted time for labs. So we're having fewer groups having to go beyond. So we let them have the full lab time plus 20 minutes to get all their data and do as much as they can. And we're having the majority, about 80 percent of the students or more, finish within that time. So when they leave lab, they're actually done. Right? So it gives them that sense of, hey, you need to manage your time really well. If you're in a clinic, you got a lot of paperwork, and some of this, by law, has to be finished today, right? You can't put it off till next week. You can't wait till the weekend. It has to be done and submitted. So students are telling us, and I got a few emails 
emails, uh, one student said that when they were filling out some of their professional uh, ethical situation scenarios on applications, they really wouldn't have known what to talk about unless we actually discussed some of these. So it gave them an opportunity to make some strong answers and strong discussion. Uh, they learned a lot about the healthcare field and professionalism and how that might be a way um, you know, that other courses may not have touched upon. Uh, we have a future project. So Chris Schultry and I, who's not here at the moment, and I are, are going to be gathering some data, much like Erica has. Um, and we're, we're going to be using a specific science student uh, skills inventory that's been validated. And we want to get, get some information from the students to find out, well, how important are some of these skills? Uh, what, how, what kind of improvement? What kind of confidence level do they have when they leave? Uh, in these five areas, so teamwork and quantitative, oral written communication and content knowledge. And then with that, after we've gathered this information, we hope to also have a future aim of saying, well, how can, how can we compare these students' perception of these before and after maybe a course series? Or how can we explore uh, how some of these skills are being used in other classes? Eventually develop models that might assist instructors and explicitly connect these to specific activities that people might be able to take and utilize in whatever course that they uh, are, are uh, teaching in the science professions. Okay. We also expose students to other opportunities. So they often think, obviously, they could be a doctor, a PT, a nurse, right? That's about it. That's all that's out there. But there's lots of cool opportunities that Brian had introduced and Erica had introduced. And, um, we use the Occupational Outlook Handbook, so one of our modules is introducing these and what kind of skills are they learning now that might be applicable in a, a field or in a job other than being a physician. Um, optometrists, I always, I'm always surprised students don't want to do this because you know, what other service industry profession can you get paid to do your service and then sell them a retail product that's has a pretty good profit margin on top of that. I mean, it's, it's a great way to be, a great way to live, right? Uh, orthotists and prosthetists, right? There's, there's good training programs in Chicago where you can work with uh, as an apprentice here, and then a couple of months out of the year, you go to Chicago and learn a few skills. You come back, you use them until you're ready to be certified. Uh, people don't like feet, I understand, but it's a good niche market. People are very... Uh, uh, they're very aware, I feel, that when their feet are bothering them and their stomach is bothering them, right? Now, obviously, you can argue teeth and headache and all that fun stuff, too, but, uh, but this is a really good niche market that people overlook. Um, there's something called a dosimetrist, which I've come across. So if you're not really interested in working with people, but you really like the clinical knowledge and anatomy, you can sort of work in this back room. You develop all these 3D models of how people are going to be radiated. Uh, you work with a nuclear physicist and a radiation oncologist to put together a plan for this patient. I mean, it's a phenomenal job, and I think Grand Valley State uh, is the only place that has a master's program in that in our state. Speech language pathologists, epidemiologists if they like statistics and data, uh, and even just more administrative role. And I've even had a few per, uh, students who went into the funeral industry as well. They learn everything about life and then, and then deal with that on the end. Um, so lastly, some of the questions I continue to ask myself all the time is, and in observing interns and in, in working in hospital scenarios is, you know, are we using teamwork and these communication strategies uh, as the students would in their intended professions, right? We're saying we're doing it and we're doing it, but sometimes it might not be as connected. We have to ask these questions and observe. Um, are the students getting an idea of how they will be challenged other than content knowledge? Okay, so time-wise, I mean, is there, are, are, we, are we sort of compartmentalizing into a time management role as well? Those are ways that we can get them ready. Okay, and then if not, how will the students know they're on the right career path? Now, obviously, it's a challenge, but I think with a little bit of, uh, you know, observation and boots uh, on the ground, it really can make a difference in their perspective. Okay. And I think we have... Yeah, more. just one last question. One last question. One last question. For you guys. I have to turn on a new question. Hold on one second. So we're thinking about uh, moving forward. It, what kind of support would you really need? Like if you wanted to do stuff like this, and ch let's sort of choose as many that apply. Like, do we need a faculty learning community? Do we need resources? Do you need a, a special consult with career services? Like, are there anything is anything on this list? Like, 
speakers from the industry. Like, we're lucky that John was a physical therapist first because he knows about all this stuff that they're supposed to be doing, very context specific. Um, I'm just wondering if any of these things, that, you know, from the college level or university level, could we provide to facilitate that? Like, additional trainings, right, is maybe a, maybe a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So maybe all all of these things are useful, right? Uh, you know, <laughs> that's great. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And like the the self assessment surveys, um, there is a, a a wealth of information out there um, that are available free and also for pay. Um, even the testing service that runs the GRE has now started um, providing validated instruments. Um, for people to start incorporating. So I actually would say, I would argue there's an entire talk on assessment tools if you wanted to use this in your classroom, if, if that's something that your department or the college would support you purchasing or using, but there are also a lot of free ones. In fact, I worked before uh, Sarah Yardaliza left, if those of you who know her, Sarah Winger, uh, also known as, um, before she left, she actually collected a whole bunch of these, um, even things about empathy and other things that you might think are a little bit harder to assess. There are instruments available, and she's collected a whole, serv a whole set of those that we could talk about, um, or someone could talk about in another type of, uh, type of session like that. Um, but um, there, there's definitely a lot out there. So the one thing, again, I just, I comment on John's work. So like, I've been doing kind of similar things in parallel. The student surveys reflect on this are, are stellar. I like, guess like when I ask on the evaluation at the end of the semester, was this useful? Do you want to do this? It's the only thing I've ever done in my class where every single person says yes. Like, yes, this was useful. Yes, it was important. Yes, it was valuable. Um, but also this idea of context specific. So like, what is your career, the career path of your students, right? Like, so we have a lot of pre-health students. So what we're doing is building on that exact system, right? It's not, it's not right. Productivity and time management might mean something, you know, if in your engineering or in other fields. So like, who do you talk to to figure out who those, what those things are? Because a lot of the people in my department were researchers. We know that. But that's not where our students are going. So like, do you need a John? Do you need someone from the industry to kind of consult with you? Do you need a Brian to come in and work with your program or with your class? Um, those, those, kinds of, those kinds of things um, come up. So, um, so with that, um, um, we're going to leave some of the other modules uh, aside. And we went right up to the end. So John and I would be happy to, to chat with you about this and take questions. And we really greatly thank you for your attention and time and interest in this really important topic. So thank you.